It is time for my 2023-24 Premier League predictions. Who will be relegated? How will the promoted sides fare? Who will be fighting for those lucrative Champions League places? Who will be winning the Premier League title? And of course, the most important question, how will Nottingham Forest fare this season? All of those questions and more will be answered in this video, so let's get into those Premier League predictions. In 20th position, I've gone for Sheffield United, the side that I am most confident on being being relegated this season. They have already sold their two best players in the form of Illumin and Jai and Sander Berge. And in my opinion, their squad is no better than the side that got relegated from the Premier League a few seasons back. So in my opinion, the Blades will be finishing rock bottom of this season's Premier League. In 19th position, I've gone for Luton Town and I do like some of the signings that they've made in their debut Premier League campaign. Issa Kabor and Ryan Giles look like a really exciting pair of wing backs, but I do think they lack the quality to stay up during this Premier League season, although I think they're more than capable of pulling off one or two shock results, especially at Kenilworth Road. And in 18th, rounding out the relegated sides, we have the absolute mess that is Wolverhampton Wanderers at the moment. At the time of recording, Julian Lopetegui has just walked from the club and been replaced by former Bournemouth manager Gary O'Neill. And I'm not gonna lie, that could be one of the biggest managerial downgrades in recent Premier League history. Moreover, their squad is looking really, really thin. They sold some of their best players or let them leave as free agents, the likes of Neves, Moutinho, Jimenez, Traore, Cody, all gone from the club. Nathan Collins sold over to Premier League Brentford as well. It looks like it could be a disaster season for Wolves and in my opinion I think that odds on to go down at the moment. In 17th position just like where they finished last season we have gone for the Toffees, Everton and I think defensively they will actually be quite good this season. I think Sean Dyche they've managed to keep the core of that defensive unit together. I think he'll whip them into shape and get them being a really solid defensive unit. Where I worry about them is where they're quite thin on the ground in terms of their attack. Dominic Calvert-Lewin looks like he's walking on eggshells at the moment in terms of his injuries. It looks like they've just sold Ellis Sims as well, who was able to at least deputise as a forward. Damari Gray looks like he could be on the way out as well, looking very thin on the ground in their attacking positions, and that could be the difference between them staying up quite comfortably and maybe even getting embroiled in this relegation scrap. I've gone for 17th, but they genuinely could get relegated. They could finish anywhere between 12th and 20th, in my opinion. In 16th, I've gone for Fulham, and this is despite the fact they had a really good return to the Premier League last season under Mark. Marco Silva. In my opinion though they quite substantially overperformed especially when you look at their underlying numbers like expected goals, expected goals against expected points and I think that comes from some quite substantial overperformances within their playing squad as well. Mitrovic I think was batting well above the level he was capable of and I think probably will be leaving towards the end of the window. It certainly looks like it's going that way. William more or less the same looks like he could be leaving as well. Pelinja, if he drops off or if he isn't available for as many matches as he was last season could be a really big miss in that midfield. They're looking very thin on the ground in terms of outright defensive midfielders. And then you've got Bernd Leno who had a fantastic shot stopping season for the Cottages last season, but you can't really rest your expectations on him to keep you up again this season. I don't think they'll be relegated by any stretch. I think they have a Premier League quality squad, but I do worry that potentially we could see a bit of a drop off from last season and maybe a drop off on expectations from what was a really great return to the Premier League last season for Fulham, but maybe a bit more of a flatter season this year. Ladies and gents, in 15th, I've gone for my beloved Nottingham Forest. Have I predicted the same as last year? Yeah, I basically have. Do I have the same expectations as last year? Again, pretty much, yeah, I do. In my opinion, the biggest issue for us at the moment is striking that balance between being solid defensively and scoring enough goals. There were times last season where we could score a decent amount of goals, but we were just letting too many in. And there were times last season as well where we were defensively really good, but we just simply weren't scoring enough to compete in our games. And I think striking that balance as cliche and obvious as that sounds is really important for Steve Cooper but with the squad having another year of experience together some of these players having their first full senior season of Premier League football under their belt and Cooper having his first season as a Premier League manager under his belt will bode well in terms of gathering the experience and know-how required to stay in the league make a minute improvement on last season and make those baby steps to becoming a solid established Premier League side or of course it could just go up in flames and we get relegated honestly either can 
could happen. In 14th, I've gone for West Ham. Initially, I actually had them finishing 15th and then Forest finishing 14th, but it looks like finally they're looking to spend some of that Declan Rice money, especially on Edson Alvarez, the Mexican international who will hopefully replicate some of the defensive output that Rice had in that midfield last season and in seasons gone by. And of course, it looks like deals for James Ward-Prowse, Scott McTominay and Harry Maguire may also be going through late in the summer window. And you can imagine with James Ward-Prowse being one of the best set piece takers in the world at the moment, and Harry Maguire at the back post knocking them in for fun. I can imagine they're going to be a very dangerous side from set pieces next year, West Ham. And of course, if you look at the underlying numbers by expected goals, expected points, all that kind of stuff, generally West Ham were pretty good last season. They were at least a solid mid-table side. I don't think they really should have been scrapping in the relegation battle for the majority of last season. The question, of course, will be how do they balance Europa League football? They struggled last season balancing the Conference League. You can only imagine the Europa League is going to take a greater toll on this team. So questions to be answered, but I think they'll be fine this season and have finished more or less where they finished last season. In 13th, I've gone for Crystal Palace. I genuinely have no idea how this season's going to go for the Eagles. They've just sold arguably their best player in the club's modern history in the form of Wilfred Zaha, but they've got Elise and Eze who are ready to step up and have big seasons for the Eagles this season. And generally, I think they've done pretty well in the transfer market over the last couple of seasons. Jefferson Lerma from Bournemouth looks like a really solid addition to their midfield to add some depth and quality in that position. Mateusz Franca looks like a really exciting talent in midfield coming out of Brazil. I think they'll be fine. Again, there's no real telling where Palace are going to finish this season other than probably in that sort of 11th to 13th region. In 12th, I've gone for Burnley and I'm basically going off of what everyone else is saying on the internet at the moment for Burnley. I can't claim to have seen very much of them last season in the Championship. I thought they were pretty good from what I did see from them. I think the interesting question for Burnley will be how do they act in the matches against the bigger, more dominant sides in the Premier League? They open today at the time of recording against Manchester City. It'll be interesting to see how they set up against company's former side because, of course, they want to play possession-based, ball-dominant football. But you can't really do that against Manchester City, especially with the personnel they have available. So it'll be interesting to see how company adapts his tactics for Premier League football and life in the Premier League with this Burnley side. Overall, I think they'll be fine. I don't think they'll finish top half like some people are saying, but I think they'll do pretty well. They've made some really good signings. That will be a solid Premier League outfit. In 11th, I've gone for Bournemouth, and whilst I think it's slightly harsh that they sat Gary O'Neill at the end of last season and didn't give him a chance, at least at a full Premier League season, who they've replaced him with in the form of Andoni Iriola from Real Vallecano looks like a really exciting young managerial prospect. And I think, at the very least, this Bournemouth team will be exciting, front footed and aggressive in their press and should be very exciting for Cherries fans. I also really like a lot of the signings that Bournemouth have made, especially at left back in the form of Milos Kerkez from AZ Altmar in the Netherlands. He's someone who I think Forrest could have potentially looked for. Just 19 years old, looks like he has a lot of on the ball value and is a very aggressive attacking wing back who I think could offer a lot of quality down that left hand side to this Bournemouth side. And like I say, I think generally they've operated very cleverly in the transfer market over the last 12 months or so. In 10th, I've gone for Brentford and of course they've lost some key personnel heading into the new Premier League season. The big one being Ivan Tony, of course, who will be missing for a large portion of the Premier League season due to his suspension. And of course, David Rye, who's moved to Arsenal, looks like he's been replaced by Freiburg goalkeeper Mark Flecken, who I'm sure is a good goalkeeper. Clearly, if Brentford win for him, he must be a good player. But I don't think he'll quite replicate what Rye was for Brentford, which is one of the best goalkeepers in the Premier League at the moment. Honestly, I don't think there's too much else for me to say about Brentford. They'll be fine. They'll be solid and mid-table side. Thomas Frank will have yet another good season and be linked to every top job in the country. And I'm sure they'll make some really interesting signings from mainland Europe will come in and gel really well with the side. I just don't think they'll quite be at the level they were last season just due to those key departures, but then hopefully bounce back next season because Brentford are a very good side. Right then, ninth, I've gone for Villa and I can't lie, I am loving what they're cooking down there in the Midlands. In terms of signings, I think they may have had one of the best windows in the Premier League this season. Moussa Diaby is just a transformative sign-in on the right-hand side of that attack. Paul Torres has so much experience in the top level of European football, has won a Europa League with Villarreal under Unai Emery, who we know so well, which is so important, coming into the left-hand side of that defence. And of course, Yuri Tielemans on a free from Leicester had so much depth, quality and experience to that midfield. I can't lie, 
They might have had the best window in the Premier League so far. However, like the next team we're going to discuss, I do think European football is going to take its toll on this team. A lot of these players have never played European football before. I think those Thursday nights are going to take its toll on the team in the long run. And I do think whilst they will make the Europa League next season, it won't be through their league position. It'll be through them winning the Conference League. I can see by February, March time, Emery just ditching the league and prioritizing essentially the conference league winning that getting into the europa league and pushing on next season because i think they need to bulk out this squad in the long term to be able to compete on those multiple fronts that they want to I have to say though villa team to watch for me this season i am so excited to see what emery does with a whole season with this villa side in eighth i've gone for brighton and i do feel like at this stage it is sacrilege to bet against the seagulls but in my humble opinion i think they will take a slight step back this season they have european football to contend with for the very first time this season and need a massive overhaul of that midfield following the sales of McAllister and Caicedo to Liverpool. I remember someone saying recently, and apologies because I don't remember who it was, that Brighton are a really interesting stage of their project. Are they going to just continue to be what they are, which is the best of the rest, make these punchy signings and continue to perform between 7th and 9th every single Premier League season? Or are they going to take that step forward? Are they going to try and really disrupt the order of the top four? Because they certainly now have the money to do so. They've made over £300 million in player sales over the last few seasons. They have the money and the infrastructure to invest quite significantly into the squad and push towards the top four. And it's at a really interesting juncture in this project in terms of which direction they choose to go in. And I genuinely just couldn't agree with that sentiment anymore. Brighton are at such an interesting point in their project where they could push on to be a regular top six team if they really wanted to but if they were comfortable in the position they're in punching above their weight every so often and being the best of the rest that's also fine but I just think they can really have the ambition I think they have now the funds through the over 300 million pounds they've made over the last few seasons to regularly challenge the establishment and become an established top six side in the future in seventh I've gone for Tottenham and I really like Ange Postacoglu as a manager I really enjoyed watching his Celtic side on the few occasions and opportunities I got to watch them over the last couple of seasons in the Scottish premiership but this is very much the beginning of a project for Tottenham it's going to take three or four years I think for them to be able to get up and compete with the big boys it's a very stark contrast in terms of style of play from what they were playing over the last two or three seasons under the likes of Antonio Conte Jose Mourinho which was low block defensive counter-attacking football compared to more possession and positional play under Ange Postacoglu who's just come in of course that being said I do like a lot of the business that they've done especially James Madison I think that's a transformative signing for this Tottenham team in terms of adding creativity into central areas something that they've been really crying out for since Ericsson left the club a few years back and of course Adoji or Adogi has just come in after his couple of year loan stint in Serie A looks like a really positive attacking left back I don't know how that's going to fit into Ange's system he seems to prefer inverting his wing backs to sort of add cover and sort of compact and congest the central positions a bit like sort of Pep the inverted fullbacks kind of idea but it'll be interesting to see maybe they could play more as a left winger he seems like a really attacking left-sided player it could allow Son to drift into more central positions maybe even be the long-term number nine solution if Harry Kane is to leave speaking of which I think I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about Harry Kane it's currently 12 o'clock on Friday afternoon and at the time of recording Harry Kane is sat on the tarmac waiting for a plane to Munich to complete his move to Bayern Munich and do his medical apparently Daniel Levy is dragging his heels and just generally being a little bit about things but we don't know exactly what's going to happen with this Tottenham move. So I'm basing this on Kane probably staying at least until January and then maybe going to like PSG or something in January. That was what my thought process was when I was writing this script. Of course, though, things could change. Things change every day in the Premier League. And this position could be from anywhere from 6th to like 10th based on Kane staying or leaving and the players they sign later in this window. In 6th, I've gone for Newcastle. I think my opinions on the tune is generally the same as everyone else in terms of them finishing probably in the top six having a good run in the Champions League but maybe not quite having the quality and depth to compete on multiple fronts and finish as well as they did last season of course they've got the Champions League to contend with and I do think like Villa and Brighton first time European football for a lot of these players is going to take its toll on the side but with that being said I do think they'll generally be fine I think they're better poised than the likes of Brighton and Villa to compete for those Europa League spaces I think Eddie Howe had a great season last year 
at Newcastle defied expectations for me. I didn't think he was anywhere near capable of doing what he did with this Newcastle side. I think their style of play will really suit Champions League and knockout football in terms of the energy and defensive solidity that they bring. Of course, though, with Newcastle, the things you've got to consider, Liverpool and Chelsea will be better this season. I think they will finish above them. I certainly think they'll have the quality and depth that Newcastle don't have, but I still think they'll finish probably in the top six and be odds on for a European place, whatever league that's in next season. In fifth, I've gone for Chelsea, and I'm not sure if I'm overestimating what I saw in pre-season, and I know you can't really take pre-season for too much in terms of value, but I've been really impressed with Poch's Chelsea since the Argentinian came in to take over the helm. I think pre-season wise, they looked really solid. It looks like they have a better identity and a better idea of tactically what they're trying to achieve, but I don't quite think they've got the quality and depth in certain positions or just simply the quality in certain positions to quite reach the Champions League this season, especially with the steps the top four have taken over the summer window as well. In terms of those positions, I think a number nine and out and out number nine would be probably top of their shopping list. I do think Nicholas Jackson looks like a really exciting prospect and was really good during pre-season, but it's a lot to put on such a young player who's not got very much experience at the top level to play a 38 game Premier League season and get Chelsea towards the top four this season after how poor they were last season. And of course, the defensive midfielder is a must for Chelsea. It looks like they've been muscled out a move for Caicedo, who looks like he could be going to Liverpool. It looks like Tyler Adams could be someone to maybe tide them over for the first few games of the season and act as a squad player. He at least adds some bite into that midfield, which they are desperately lacking now N'Golo Kante has left the club. I do think those two positions and the lack of quality and depth in those positions is what's going to hold them back from quite reaching the Champions League. But you've got to remember, this is Poch, a manager who takes a couple of seasons to implement his ideas and get his squad performing at the level he wants them to. So two or three seasons time, I could see them challenging for a title, but I think it's a step too far to get into the top four this season. In fourth, I've gone for Liverpool. I think this is largely down to the fact that they have successfully overhauled that midfield heading into the next season. They have completely rebuilt it with really exciting players. Alexis McAllister from Brighton for the fee they paid from as well is a really good pickup. Someone who's still fairly young, who offers some good creativity in the final third, defensively is a pretty solid number eight and can come short, receive the ball off the back line and help them build out from the back. And of course, Sabasolai, I can't claim I've seen him too much, but what I saw from him in the Champions League and in European football, I just think he looks incredible. Kevin De Bruyne-esque in terms of his ball striking ability, massively creative, very different from the number eights that Klopp and Liverpool have preferred since Coutinho left the club a few years back. It suggests to me that they're going for more of a box style midfield like they were playing towards the back end of last season where Trent comes into the midfield, Robertson drops back into that back three and they create kind of a box with the two eights, Trent and then whoever the defensive midfielder is going to be. Looks like it could be Kai Sado, who I think would be outrageously good for this Liverpool team but of course they need to get that over the line that looks like a really solid midfield all of a sudden that looks very good for five six seven years to challenge for Premier League titles and European glory their attack looks good as ever Jota will be coming back to full fitness Luis Diaz more or less the same as well Nunes and the season of Premier League football under his belt Gakpo more or less the same as well and Salah I think he could be a dark horse for the golden boot. I think with the creativity alongside him, the defensive work behind him as well, I think it's just going to unshackle him and he could hit 25, 26, 27 goals again in the Premier League this season after what was apparently a down year for the Egyptian last year. In third, I've gone for Manchester United, which may not sound like much of an improvement, but I do think they will look like a transformed side this season. Andre Onana looks like just a night and day upgrade on David De Gea. So much better with his distribution, so much more confident coming and claiming crosses, and I think just as good a shot stopper as the Spaniard. Mount adds so much depth into that midfield and so much work off the ball, of course, as well. Rasmus Thomas Hoyland is an exciting signing, one for the future that they paid so, so much money for, for seven goals last season. That being said, though, I think he will be good this season for Man United. I think having someone for Rashford to work off, we saw it with Veghorst last season when he signed in January, having someone for Rashford to play balls off, to work off, having a presence up forward to launch balls up to from deep positions is obviously a really great improvement on what they had last season, especially with Martial's consistent injury problems. I think if they do get Amrabat over the line, they automatically look like one of the deepest 
pools of talent for a team in the Premier League in terms of the quality they have in those positions. But I do still worry about that right centre-back and right back position. I think Varane just simply is not good enough on the ball and is very rarely fit and able to play in that position. And Wan-Bissaka and Delo are good for spells, but they're just not consistent enough to challenge a, that position in a Premier League title challenging team. So I think that needs to be somewhere they address maybe next summer or in January for them to then push on for second or maybe even a title next season. So in second, I have gone for Arsenal. I think again, they're going to fall short of the mark. I think they're one or two signings away from going the distance and really challenging City to the Premier League title, but they will take steps forward this season. Declan Rice walks into that midfield absolutely as a number four, as a number eight, whatever position, he'll be great for them this season. Havertz at depth across that front line and at that number eight position. And Urien Timber, we saw him playing as a left back essentially or as a left centre back in the Community Shield. He had depth across that back line. David Rea even coming in to compete for that number one shirt alongside Aaron Ramsdale. I still think though there may be one or two signings away from competing especially in those wide areas. If Saka or Martinelli pick up an injury, depth options in those positions becomes like Smith Rowe who's good but not quite at that level to challenge for a Premier League title. Havertz who I Things probably better in more central positions, especially as a number 10 or a number 8. So really you're left with not a lot of quality and depth in those wide areas. And I think that's maybe the one weakness they have in this team. If they were to pick up injuries in those positions, especially with the amount of football that Saka and Martinelli played over the last couple of seasons, that could leave them just short of that Premier League title. So of course that means in first place we have... Manchester City to retain yet again the Premier League coming off the back of that unprecedented treble and possibly one of the greatest Premier League sides we have ever seen if not the greatest and in my opinion they've only really strengthened this win though. Now they have lost Gundogan and Riyad Mahrez in this summer I'll give you that Gundogan of course gone to Barcelona Riyad Mahrez has gone off to Saudi Arabia but I think they've done a really good job in replacing Gundogan in the form of Kovacic someone who won't quite replicate the German's goal output but he'll do a really good job of offering good defensive coverage and is an exceptional ball carrying midfielder who could play in a double pivot if maybe that's what they look to shift to for this season and I think already they're pretty deep in their forward line they've got Alvarez Foden who could play more minutes Cole Palmer came on and looked really exciting in the community shield and of course Joshko Gvardiol's come in into that back line to offer elite coverage in that position he could play left back left center back play back four back three anything really you need from the Croatian he's a fantastic defender they've splurged they've played a lot of money for the Croatian but I think long term he could be at that team at the top level for at least a decade potentially and automatically walks into that start in 11. The big question of course will be what's Pep going to do this season is he going to stick to the four centre backs sort of system he had last season where John Stone steps up into the midfield is he going to change things completely again of course he's got his finger on the pulse of the tactical trends of the Premier League so it'll be interesting to see how he adapts this team and looks to hopefully have a good run in the Champions League maybe even look to retain it whilst also hopefully winning the Premier League from their point of view. So there we have it my 2023-2024 Premier League predictions let me know yours in the comment section below and your thoughts on my predictions which you can see on screen right now and of course whilst you're down there don't forget to drop a like on this video subscribe to the channel and ring that notification bell to stay up to date with Nottingham Forest and Premier League videos on the channel over the course of the 23-24 Premier League season. Well that being said thank you so much for watching I will catch you later.